Thank you very much, Chris. That's all I can say is that's very embarrassing, but thank you. So um, I'm going to start by saying I don't, we're, we're going to change tactics a little bit and go back to more the individual animal caught in a, in a rescue, in a situation in need of being rescued. I'm, I have no experience with large-scale disasters and bushfires and whatnot, so the expertise lies with somebody else in that situation. I guess what I'm going to do is tell you what I have learned and where I've started from and where I've gone. And as a veterinarian, um, when I ca I'm called to a situation where I need to rescue an animal, what sort of things do I think of, what are my thought processes and where I'm going to um, head with the whole situation. So the veterinary's role, it, there's no doubt the veterinary's role and presence at a rescue scene is crucial to make a medical diagnosis for what exactly might be happening with the animal, what might need to be treated, decide what needs to be stabilized on an emergency um, level, either immediately before the animal is moved or extricated from wherever he's in or immediately after, depending on the situation. Um, we need to do things like sedate the horse, potentially anesthetize the animal, so making removal from the problem um, a little safer for people. And we need to look at the situation and say, hey, listen, does this horse actually need to be euthanized? So, well, listen, I mean, that's what I do every day, right? So how difficult can this be? Well, it's really, oh, and I was going to say the rescuers see you as the paramedic. So, and that was a, that was a bit of an epiphany for me um, with some of the earlier situations I got involved in because I hadn't really thought about my role in that matter. But anyways, really, how, that's what vets do all the time every day, however. This is not another day at the office, right? You are faced with all sorts of challenges and all sorts of situations you're not used to. You're out of your comfort zone. You are out in the situation in a field where you can't just turn around and walk. Like I have always been lucky to work in a clinic, turn around, I need another instrument. I need another set of hands. I need this. So you have to start thinking outside the box. This picture is Slade from the RSPCA in New South Wales. And when we initially went to this situation, um, it started with, well, I need, I need you to sedate some horses so we can move them off an island. And I very quickly realized that this was going to be bigger than Ben-Hur when Slade was there loading up his dart gun. And I thought, well, why do we need a dart gun? Oh, we can't get within about 100 meters of them, and we've got to find them with the helicopter. Radio. All right, well, maybe I need to rethink exactly where this is going. So I think as a profession, it is fair to say that many of us dread being called to an animal incident, all right? We have no formal animal rescue knowledge. It is not in our curriculum um, for students, and it is not something you necessarily see all that often. We really have, as a profession, inadequate knowledge to safely work in the hot zone, okay? We do not have an understanding, in general, as a profession, of the incident control system and how to work within that system. And our idea of personal protective equipment is lacking and needs to be dramatically shored up as a profession. And these are some of the challenges, I guess, as a veterinarian trying to educate other veterinarians that we face. So when a student says to me, Christine, I have absolutely no idea what is wrong with that horse. I have no idea where to start, and throws up their hand and says, I got no clue. I've got nothing. So you say, no, you always know something, right? Take it back to first principles. You will know something. If you don't panic, stop and think about what you actually know. First principles to us include animal behavior, all right? And this has been touched on, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but it really is when you're faced with a situation, you think, I'm not sure how I'm going to get to the back end of it. Take a step back and think about what you do know and start from there. So we've talked about this. We know horses are prey animals. They have a very strong um, flight response. They're motivated primarily by fear. And there is very little anybody, if anything, anybody can do to calm a horse down when they're in a situation where they believe that they are in significant trouble. No matter how domesticated or how much the owner loves it or how good the horse is outside that situation, all of that really changes in a rescue situation. They have a very strong flight and herding mentality. They have a flight zone, and we've talked about this. And the only thing I'll say about this slide, because I think we've discussed the flight zone enough, is it can be used to your advantage, or it can be used, or it can become a disadvantage very quickly. In the picture on the left, um, which is a photo courtesy of Jim Green, um, that is a cow in a swimming pool, right? If you want to move that cow from the shallow end or the, to the deep end or to another side or whatever, all you need to do is quietly move a group of people around to that side, and the cow all going well, will quietly move away from those people and go position itself where you want it. So you could use the flight zone in your favor. However, if you're trying to corral a group of horses, and this is a situation, this is a training course, but there's a group of um, rescue personnel going up to a group of horses in a corner, and those horses are, whoops, what have I done? That's good, huh? 
There we go. Um, those horses are actually thinking, where is my exit strategy? How am, I, how am I going to get out of there? And once one of those horses go, the rest of them will follow. So in a situation where you're trying to like, form a, a group and a line and walk in and try to catch a bunch of horses, things are going to go south very, very quickly. Um, we've talked about how to approach the animal, make sure the animal is aware, stay calm, talk quietly. And sometimes that means you need to stop and take a deep breath and say, all right, I've got to think about this for a second. I've got to think about the first words that are going to come out of my mouth. And to me, it sometimes means just count to three because it is very easy to get yourself and let your voice start to, to, start to wind up and start to get very worried about the situation. So you need to make yourself stay calm. Moving slowly and confidently, never approach from the front or the rear um, for obvious reasons of safety, but also the, that's where the horse doesn't see particularly well, especially if you approach from the rear too. That is a very predatory um, uh, concern for the animal and uh, is a real no-no. And steer clear of the kicking zone. So, and the kicking zone is far larger than one might think. And the kicking zone, the head butting zone, when they throw their head, wherever the front legs can go. And I will say one thing, that if you're going to get kicked, you are better to get kicked about one centimeter from the horse, right? Where people get really, really injured is when they are about a half a meter to a meter away. At the full extent and the full... Um, um, momentum and acceleration of that animal's legs. That's really where, when you're going to get yourself in trouble. But ideally, you don't even get yourself into that zone at all. And again, this has been mentioned, if you're nervous, the horse is going to know about it. So it, you're not going to pretend to the horse. He'll figure it out in about two seconds flat. So they have a great sense of sight, hearing, touch, and smell. Um, you can consider blindfolding, and so, some of those horses will calm down. Some of them will be very, very refractory to it. So that is a situation that is very dynamic, and you need to make a decision as you go along of whether it's going to help. Um, as far as hearing goes, they're very sensitive to much higher frequencies um, than humans, and before you start turning on a chainsaw or any bit of equipment, even if it doesn't seem particularly loud to you, have a think about what the frequency is. Watch the animal and the animal's reaction to it, because it may very well be that you need to take alternative measures like plug the horse's ear, give it more sedation, actually anesthetize it, because whatever noise you're creating is actually um, is going to be a big disadvantage and a big issue. So touch can be comforting, um, as it is in this particular situation. This was, at, again, at a training course, and, and um, I'm not sure this lady had had much to do with horses, but the horse is quite happy with this. It can also be quite stimulating, and I really am not sure. Let's see if I can make this work. Well, that video is not going to work, unfortunately. There's a guy, where's the ID? Yeah, I just try it. Oh well. Anyways, that um, video is somebody walking this um, horse across the road, and some fool comes up behind it and gives it a good slap on the rear end, and he ends up getting double barreled and being uh, knocked to the ground. So, um, in that case, the touch was not particularly comforting. Um, trapped animals, and um, we've talked about this. You'll have periods of initial fighting and panic followed by periods of immobilization. It is hard to know when your periods of immobilization are actually going to cease and you're going to have more periods of, of fighting and panic. So even though they're trapped, at any moment they could explode and you could, um, you could be in a really bad situation. Most of the time, they won't move or won't do too much, or at least they'll go back into a mobilization mode as long as they don't sense that there is an exit strategy. But once they think, geez, that float door is open, or I can see a path out, out of this, they will continue to fight until they feel that that path has been closed. All right, that's a very quick run through through animal behavior. We could talk for an hour on that, but we're going to move on to the next kind of first principle that you need to think about when you're attending a rescue scene as a vet, and that's some of the anatomy um, issues that you need to deal with. So the eyes are set on the side of the head. I think Hatchie was making some comment about hopefully in the next model we'll improve on that, but I'm not sure I'm going to be around to see that. Um, they have limited visions in some planes, in particular right behind them and immediately in front of them, but they have excellent vision in others. These eyes are very, very easily damaged. They're, from a veterinary's perspective, they're actually really hard to treat, okay? A bat, and this is a terrible eye, um, that went south was deteriorated like that within a 12-hour period, okay, of the injury happening. So, they're really, really difficult to treat. They're very labor intensive to treat and they're expensive to treat. They're also extremely painful for the horse and it is only going to add to their anxiety and agitation if they have um, an issue with their eye. And in some cases, nobody, nobody likes to lose an eye on a horse, but the bottom line is um, 
the horses will live quite happily with only one eye. If you're a thoroughbred racehorse in this country, it is career ending because you're not allowed to race. So what can you do at the rescue scene? Well, you can clear the debris away. You can cover the eyes. In this picture here, we've got a head protector on, all right? And those are specifically fitted to horses' heads. They're easy to strap on. They've got eyes for, or holes for the, the ears, holes for the eyes, and they sit on there quite nicely, and they don't shift very well as long as you get them on there well to begin with. If you don't have that, well, you can use what you've got. You can use towels. This was a bandage, a leg bandage that somebody had. I think I might have had it and grabbed it on the, as I ran out of the clinic. Who knows? But you can use whatever to help protect that eye. And then failing that, pretty much every rescue vehicle I've ever seen um, has a life jacket. And you put that life jacket on the other way, so it's on backwards, and it is, at least keeps the horse's head off the ground. It pads the facial nerve on the side of the face, and it does offer the eyes some protection. It doesn't like to sit on there particularly well, and you need to adjust it or add some tape to it or something like that, but it is absolutely better than nothing um, at this situation. Now, once it's safe, so once the horse is out of the situation and say I'm waiting for it to, I'm giving it IV fluids, well I'm waiting for it to warm up and get a little bit better hydrated before we see if it's going to be able to get up or want to get up. You can consider doing things like rinsing the eyes of, with saline. You can get topical antibiotics in there. You can do that safely without a problem as long as there's no steroids in your medication. And you can give them some pain relief like some phenylbutazone or flunix and some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. All right, the respiratory system. So horses are obligated, obligate nasal breathers. They have to breathe through their nose, okay? So in, in, we need to remember that. The other, I guess, important bit about the respiratory system is flexion of the horse's neck really significantly compromises um, their airway. So if, and you can see when these ponies are swimming, they got their nose out of the water and they got their head extended, and that is natural for them, okay? So the bottom line is, if that nose goes under the water, even one snortful, one lungful, one breath of water, you will have aspiration pneumonia. I guarantee it. it. The horse may get over itself. It may just be respond with antibiotics. But there have been tons of horses that are rescued that have died of aspiration pneumonia a few days later. And nobody's even aware that their nose has gone under the water. It is critical to keep their nose above the water. The other thing we need to think about, or I think about um, respiratory system-wise, is the horse's um, thorax, or the horse's chest, okay? So the horse has an absolutely enormous abdomen full of a lot of guts, which are very, very, very heavy. A horse lying in recumbency or upside down or stuck somewhere is going to get increasing distension of its GI tract, and it's going to put increasing pressure on the diaphragm and cause increasing pressure in the lungs. The longer that horse is down, the more the down lung is going to collapse, and all of those things are going to compromise that horse's ability to breathe and indirectly um, will compromise the horse's ability to maintain its cardiac output as well. So thoracic compression is really critical. You don't want, because it's going to lead to cardiovascular collapse and shock and potentially death. So as I said, you need to keep the nares above the water, the nostrils above the water, avoid prolonged neck flexion, and minimize thoracic um, compression. You'd be amazed at how many people think it's a good idea to sit on horses' chests for any length of time, and you really should not do that. And then be aware of bloat. Now, there's not much you can do in a, in a situation to deal with the bloat. Those are things you need to think of after the horse is rescued and what you're going to do to help it. Try to keep the head the same level of the horse's body or higher to minimize edema. So putting towels underneath it, life jackets underneath it, and keep it up. The longer that horse's head is in a dependent or the lowest position, the more general edema you're going to get around that head, the harder it's going to be for them to breathe. Then they start working harder to breathe, they get more edema, and it becomes a very quickly a self-perpetuating situation. All right, the limbs. They're essential for survival. Horses can't live. They need all four of them. They don't, they don't like living with just three. Um, and they have little soft tissue um, covering, and which is very, very easily damaged. This poor little pony was pulled out of a duck effluent tank by some well-meaning people, um, and she came in and, and she had at least two open joints or open tendon sheaths in every single leg, plus a horrible aspiration pneumonia. She did live, but it took a long time, and I think if she wasn't a tough little pony and didn't have some pretty dedicated owners, we wouldn't have got to the back end of this one. That pony, I saw that pony and I took this picture when the horse was admitted and that was within an hour of being pulled out of that duck effluent tank. It was just horrific. So horses' limbs are not really designed to be pulled on. The one exception is a straight line and I'm guessing this video is not going to work either unless the IT guy's gotten somewhere with it. But um, I'll try it. Yeah. It is, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I, I, we, it ran earlier. Um, let me try this. This one is important. Where is... All right, this is the exception. You can pull the legs right angle to the horse's body in a straight line. This is how we move horses all the time into recovery and out of recovery at our clinic. This does not hurt the horse. We don't have any problems with it. Um, and this is about the only exception to pulling on the legs, okay? Um, we use the hoist system. I believe it's exactly the same that they've just put in, in the, um, or a similar system that they've put in at this school. And that is pretty darn standard for moving horses around. If they are not being pulled, the legs are not being pulled in this direction, you need to stop because it's not acceptable. Alrighty. So, protection of the limbs at a rescue scene. You want to remove debris and obstacles. Um, do not attach limbs to any tractors or anything like that. A few people on a hauling team, fine, but if you start attaching it to anything with a motor, you're in trouble and you need to stop. Um, do not apply force to the side in abduction. So again, if it's not in a straight line, do not pull on those legs. You can pull the dependent leg forward if you're safe, if you've got a recumbent animal, but a lot of times you can't get into a position to actually pull that down leg forward to relieve some of the pressure over their muscles. And then I guess you could consider bandaging the legs if it's safe. I have yet to be at a rescue where I thought it was a good idea for me to climb in and put some bandages on. But I suppose in theory, if it was down a tank, for instance, and the horse was standing there and sedated and quite quiet, you might be able to put some leg bandages on. Again, the head and the tail is not designed to be hauled on. Um, this was a horse that presented to me a couple days after being pulled out of the trailer by the tail, an overturned trailer, again by some well-meaning people. Um, they brought the horse to me, it had a number of injuries, but one of the complaints was the horse was not passing any manure. And the reason being is the horse had some pretty significant fractures of its sacrum here and had lost or damaged the nerves basically and couldn't actually pass any manure. Now with treatment and some time and some help, the horse came fine, but um, this is a lesser example of I think what Rebecca showed us earlier where the whole tail was, was actually pulled off. I sus Yes, we are very good. I'll give you the coffee. But um, all right. So other things I need to be thinking of as a rescue scene, and this is communication and working as a team, right? I think a couple people have made some comments that we're not very good at playing um, with others. I think that's an individual thing, but certainly we are used to working as individuals a lot of the times and independently and not having as much support as maybe, uh, certainly as the rescue services would have. We've talked about this, so I'm not going to belabor this, but when you get to the scene, especially if emergency services are not there, you need to start thinking about what's the hot zone, who should be in the hot zone, get the owner out of the hot zone immediately as best as you can, or well, without exception, but get them out of this area. And then once you get um, rescue services on site, then you can start talking about, okay, talking to who's the incident controller, who's going to be the safety officer, what is the plan, where do we go from here. Um, this is just actually an excerpt from the course that Hatchie and I do, and we did these laminates. So when people did the course and then didn't go to a rescue for a few years, they would get to a scene and potentially have a little cheat sheet, if you will. And these are the sort of things that we want, as, as a veterinarian, I need to be thinking of as I get, as I get on the scene if somebody's already um, not there controlling it for me. Again, discuss PPE recommendations, gloves, helmets, etc., with emergency services, and I'll touch base more on that. An animal handler, and Hatchie talked about this over um, in the demonstration, so I won't be delab belabor that. Good place for a tool dump, where we know where the tools are going to be. We can keep them organized, we can keep them clean, and we're not tripping over them. Clear the area for hazards. Most importantly, identify a safe place to put the horse in once rescued. There's no sense pulling it out and then thinking, okay, now what? And we've obviously mentioned that we need to identify a safe egress for rescuers. So managing clients and owners can be exceptionally challenging. Um, and as, as we know, incidents at an incident, an owner may treat their horse as a child and act irrationally. They often have feelings of guilt and will ask people to do things that are not necessarily safe. Um, so you need to remove them from the hot zone. So the bottom line is lack of training plus emotion is just a liability and is not going to be helpful. You need to get them out of the hot zone. We've talked about this again. 
they're a valuable source of information. They will tell you things about the horse that you need to know. So don't exclude them, just get them out of the danger area. Knowing you care will be a huge comfort to them and making them feel a part of the rescue without being in that hot zone will be very important and will make life a lot easier. So give them a task. So ask them to get a halter, get a blanket, get water, get hay, contact their insurance company, prepare a place for the rescued horse. If they're being painful, ask for each one of those individually. So go get a halter, get the halter and say, great, now I need you to go get me a bucket of water. Now I need you to get me some hay. So it will buy you some time. Um, and I also need to be a lot more cognizant of safety than I certainly have been in my past part of my career. Safety first, people and animals, people in particular, must be prioritized. The risks are endless, right? You can think of a million, it's a million ways you can get hurt. For veterinarians, the things that I'm not familiar with are more likely to hurt me likely, such as equipment that the rescue services are used to dealing with that I'm not used to being around and don't have the wherewithal to know where I'm going to be. I rely on them to keep me safe in that, in that sense. Sharps control, we've heard enough about sharps control. And zoonotic diseases, which I don't think has come up particularly yet, um, but is worth teaching or, or talking about for a second. Um, so as a vet, I need to identify and manage risks associated with the animal and feed information to the incident controller about what their plan is and what I think the implications of their plan might be. And they're more than happy to listen to you if you've got a rational approach and you're working as a team and communicating effectively. Um, your personal protective equipment is only good if you put it on, so I've been told. And, um, but it is important because I got, we got to that one thing. It was very important that I had a helmet on, but the, had I ever put that helmet on? No. So there's no sense having PPE, goggles that don't fit or fall off your face, or a helmet that you can't secure on properly, right? So make sure from a veterinary point of view, the PPE you have is actually going to be effective. Um, and again, from a safety point of view, you have to prioritize. Every time I think about, should I give it a bit more sedation? Should I do this? What's going to keep the people the safest? And that drives my decision. We've talked enough about PPE, so I'll move on from there. But the bottom line is, I need to remember as a veterinarian, the rescuers are going to look to me for guidance regarding the risk the trapped animal poses to them, especially if they're not the experts, the ones that are doing the training, but they're new to this. So you need to tell them you need to put a helmet on if they're not wearing helmets. This horse could kick you. This horse is, is, is still in a position to hurt you. So really, the, the rescue team is likely to look to the veterinarian for some advice if they're not experts in large animal rescue. So sharps handling, again, we've heard many vets think nothing of using their mouths to hold various objects. We um, can discard things by kind of randomly tossing them behind us. It's called the tossing method. It's effective unless you get in trouble for it. Um, you'd be amazed. I still find students and, and other veterinarians all the time that stick 18 gauge needles in their pocket or in their back pocket and then they sit down and they go, ouch! Yeah, what do you reckon? So anyways, it's amazing. Take needle caps off with their teeth. As a profession, it's appalling. It's embarrassing and we must actually do something about it. So why? Well, it's our safety. Workplace health, health and safety would come in and just have a field day with some of the, ta the practices of veterinarians. Um, owners and handlers safety, rescue team safely, safety, and in this country, zoonotic diseases. All right, they're becoming more and more of an issue. They will kill people, some of them. And we need to be aware of this. Um, the vet assistant, and I've touched about that on, um, over there, I think it's, it's a great thing. It's made life a whole lot easier for me to manage my sharps and stay safe. And there will be somebody that, and I carry a little, a little tray around with needles and syringes and, and top-up drugs that I can just hand to somebody. And if I turn around, I need something, it's, it's right there. Far safer, very effective, just takes one person if you've got it. Um, all right, so I'm going to touch on zoonotic di diseases just for a second. Um, so these are infections and conditions which basically can be passed from animals to humans, all right? And some of the examples include some of the neurologic diseases that I'm sure you've all heard of with the Hendra virus in particular. Has, um, there's been a lot of press and a lot of information filtering through about that. Um, Lissa virus, there was recently the first horse identified with Lissa virus up in Queensland, which Lissa virus is very, very close to the rabies virus, which we're considered rabies free, but I think we'll be having a rethink about exactly um, what's going on with that. Um, the Kunjin virus, it, it technically can be passed to people. Um, there's all sorts of gastrointestinal diseases like Salmonella, Cryptosporidium, Clostridium, that sort of thing. If you deal with small animals, 
um, Q fever, and leptospirosis. So there's a, there's a myriad of them. The one that we'll focus on for a minute is Hendra because that's the one that probably most people are going to be familiar with. When I was EVA New South Wales president, it happened to be 2011 when we had the big recrudescence of the Hendra virus positives in this country, okay, in Queensland and northern New South Wales. There's more statistics similar to this, but the one I had at hand was there were 10 horses that were confirmed having died from Hendra virus in New South Wales in 2011. 60% of those were caught in fences, all right? 60% of those, depending on when somebody got to them, could have been looked at and thought that horse is caught, that horse is trapped, that horse may be in need of rescue. Why is that such a high statistic? Well, because most horses with Hendra virus become neurological, meaning they become weak, they become ataxic, they don't know where their legs are, they become disoriented, some of them become blind, but those horses get themselves into situations which the down ditches, cotton fences, et cetera, et cetera, because of their primary disease process, right? So I think when we go out to a rescue scene as a veterinarian and we look at something that's caught, especially if you think, geez, I wonder if that, that's an odd position or I wonder if the horse could have gotten itself out of, we need to in the back of our mind be thinking, maybe this horse is sick, maybe that's why it, it's got itself into this position. So the very disturbing thing about Hendra from a veterinary community, all right, is that infection occurs and the virus is shed, okay? So that means I could get it, the horse beside it, and you do have to have fairly close contact with very high levels of respiratory secretions and whatnot. It's not an easy disease to catch, but it is a horrid disease to have, and all horses will die from it because if they get it, they must be destroyed um, by law and under the Oz Vet plan, and if humans contract it, then um, there's well, it's about a 70% mortality rate, and the people who have survived um, are left with some long um, standing issues which are not very pleasant. But what I was gonna say is the infection occurs and that virus is being shed before those horses show any clinical signs. Not a little bit quieter, there's no fever, there's no nothing. It's a fairly short window, but it is possible that a horse that is completely clinically normal could have Hendra and could be shedding virus. The odds, remote, but they're not zero. So we know that Hendra is passed from flying foxes to humans or not pass from flying foxes to humans, sorry, it must go through the horse, okay? We don't know a huge amount about how horses get Hendra, but we think that they eat bat feces and bat droppings and bat um, uh, partially digested food and that sort of thing. Um, and then the humans can get it from the horses. Interestingly enough, probably, I guess it'd be 18 months ago, um, it was confirmed, it was, there was uh, vi levels of virus found in a dog on a property, right? So I guess where I'm going with all of this is it's a scary disease and as a veterinarian when I go out to these situations it's in a relatively uncontrolled thing and if I think there's even a remote chance that this animal has an infectious or a zoonotic disease I need to be informing the rescue team. They're not going to be in a position to be able to make that judgment. It's the, perf it's the veterinarians that need to. All right. So finally, after I'm thinking about all those things, and now I finally think, right now I go back to what I normally do, right? I normally look at the horse and decide exactly what I need to do with it and what the problem is. So I need to make a medical assessment to decide what the extent of the injury is, the prognosis for life, and the first, one of the first decisions I need to make is do I think that this is a rescue or a recovery operation, okay? And that may change. I may think we start as a rescue and as things evolve, I may go, mm, no, we're, we, we, this is not going to be viable. We need to stop. But I cannot, in good conscience, put people's lives at risk rescuing something that needs to be euthanized. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, this horse here, for instance, is not going to be saved, all right? It's got an open fracture. It's destroyed all of its blood vessels. It's destroyed all of its soft tissues, its tendons, its ligaments in the back. If, if you identify that, I don't care where you are, that horse, you can't euthanize it fast enough, all right? So after getting through those things and making a decision, is this rescue or is this recovery, what kind of medical stabilization can I provide? Can I provide some analgesia? Can I treat them for shock? Can I give them some fluids, some corticosteroids, some um, non something along those lines? That is going to be very dependent on the situation. Sometimes you cannot offer safe medical sa um, stabilization until the horse is actually out of the situation it is in, sometimes you can. So, and again, rescuers are gonna need your guidance about does this horse, is it appropriate to stabilize this horse before you get it out or do we need to get it out and I worry about stabilizing and treating down the track. 
Um, I'm also, when I'm making a decision, what can I, is there something I can stabilize and is this a viable option? I'm looking at limbs, I'm looking for fractures, I'm looking for open, draining, septic synovial structures, meaning joints or tendon sheaths, because in horses they're expensive, difficult to treat and absolutely life-threatening. Um, has that horse been down so long that it has severe muscle injury and is unable, unlikely to be able to get up and then is there an option to get it to a hospital where it can be managed as a downer effectively? Um, has the horse gotten in the situation it is because it's broken his neck or broken its thoracic spine? You will come across that, so as best as you can do, do a limited neurologic exam, which is often just does this horse have any sort of deep pain sensation in its limbs, which is just maybe just poking or looking and seeing, can it move its limb, is there purposeful movement there? And then looking at things like, is the horse exhausted? Undoubtedly. Is the horse dehydrated? Almost for sure. Is the horse cold? better bet on it. So those things are almost boxes that you automatically mentally tick as things you're going to have to address. Now, moving on to sedation. Um, for me, and uh, there's always, I think, my definition of sedation may be different from the rescuer's definition of sedation. So it's very important to talk to the incident commander and the, and the safety officer about what their expectations are about where things are going and where they need to be and what your ideas are. Because I know Hatchie has said to me on occasion, I'd like you to sedate that horse, but in my language, he wanted it anesthetized, right? So make sure from a veterinary point of view that you've got your definitions and you're communicating appropriately. To me, when you sedate the horse, it can still walk or move to assist the rescue. It might increase human safety, but it's not going to immobilize that animal and that animal is still potentially going to be able to kick, strike, and injure somebody um, if stimulated or frightened or, or whatever. Um, I think Jim talked about natural sedation. Probably food is, you'd be amazed horses will eat in that, in that dramatic situation. How many horses will eat and how many horses will just get out no matter how sick they are and close to death and turn around and eat something. It is amazing. Um, you can try cotton wool in their ears. You can try twitching them, either nose, twitch. I prefer not to touch the ears, but I will if I have to. Um, a companion animal, depending on the situation, may just keep the horse a little quiet and a little more relaxed until you're ready to actually get it out of the situation it's gotten itself in. The owner may help or hinder. I would say have the owner back out of the way. Most of the time they're going to be a hindrance for all the reasons we've talked about and in some situations um, may be blindfolded. This horse here is a horse that had a radius fracture. Um, it's in an Anderson sling post recovery and it would get very, very agitated standing in that sling when its sedation started to wear off. As long as we stuffed food in front of it, it would stand there and eat quietly. It's amazing what food will do. So chemical sedation, um, things that we can do chemical sedation wise, IV, if you can safely get IV access, that's our preference for sure. It's fast, it's reliable. If you can't get safe IV access, then we have very good, very effective drugs that can be used intramuscularly. You just need to be a bit patient. Probably not one of my strong points, but I'm getting better as I get older. Um, so it is, it is by far and away probably should be used more than we use it. We tend to think, well, we'll just try to get the vein. We'll get ourselves into that position. We need to be careful about that. And oral is slow and unreliable and generally um, not used. If you, if you can get to the mouth, you can get to a muscle somewhere. So, and never underestimate adrenaline. And whenever I talk to people about this, people want a prescriptive recipe of how much do I give sedation-wise. There is no prescriptive recipe. It completely depends on the situation. And no matter what I think I start with, I add about 50% because of adrenaline, right? And it, we are taught as veterinarians to give as little as we need, to give it only to effect, to top up if, if you need to, which is not a big deal. In a rescue situation, it is a big deal because A, when you start giving drugs and you start, they half get sedated and then you do something and frighten them and they get more wound up, they become more and more refractory to your top ups, they become less and less effective and you've compromised and put people's lives in jeopardy. So try to throw out the window what you know about the old exhausted dehydrated horse and I'll just give it a little bit and see how it goes. Lean towards the heavy handed, put the human safety first. All right, heavier sedation is recommended for lifting, dragging and fitting slings. Um, and in this situation we're looking for the horse not to react quickly or unexpectedly but can still walk or move to assist the rescue. And again I talked about the top up so we won't go over that. Drug choices for sedatives, um, acepromazine, I don't like and I don't tend to use it very much in this situation. Um, it doesn't give you any pain relief, it's pretty slow acting, it's unreliable, 
it's got pretty significant cardiovascular compromise and it's long acting. It takes a long time to go out of their system. So this is not personally a drug I reach for. Um, I think it's a great tranquilizer and I do use it in other situations, but for me personally in a rescue one, it's not, my, not what, I, what I think about. The alpha-2 agonists include xylazine and romifidine and detomidine. On the contrary, they've got great analgesia. Um, they're dose dependent. They're pretty short acting. They act pretty quickly. Um, and they'll certainly calm the horse down and make it more tractable. They are very good drugs. Um, in theory, they're not great for severely compromised horses, but nothing is. And being stuck wherever it is is not great for the severely compromised horse either, right? So, so you need to kind of step back and keep things in perspective. Um, and so ideally, theoretically, academically, we should be adjusting the dose to maximize safety to rescuers, but not further compromise the animal. But err on the high side, put the, put the human life first. And I t I'll tell you, I've been in some situations where I've had to give horses tremendous amounts of sedatives. You almost can't kill them, right? If you can kill them with a sedative, chances are you're going to lose them anyways quickly. So other things to be aware of with things like alpha-2 agonists, um, xylazine in particular alone may increase the kick reflex in horses. And so they may look very quiet up front and some of those horses unexpectedly, no forewarning, will kick violently. And if you're in the, if you're in the firing range, they will kick hard enough to kill you. So you need to be aware of that. For that reason, I probably reach for detomidine more often. Um, and humans, inadvertent human injection or mucosal spray, and let's face it, this is probably the situation where we're more likely to have an inadvertent human spray, you know, injection or, or um, problem than any other situation. But um, it can, overdose can lead to cardiovascular issues and in severe cases, respiratory arrest. Um, opioids, which are basically morphine-like drugs, okay? They, again, great, calm, or great analgesia, but if you use them just on their own, they'll make most horses excited and go through quite a, a dramatic excitement phase. So we use them in combination with alpha-2 agonists 99% of the time, I'll say. Um, again, they're rapid onset, dose dependent, and very reliable. So for me, the alpha-2 agonist plus the opioid is the sedative pro protocol that I reach for first and serves me in the best stead. Again, I can't give anybody a recipe. I can't give anybody doses. Um, safety must come first. In general, you're going to need more than you think. Top-ups are left, less effective. And uh, probably the only rule of thumb I'll give you is if you're going to go IM versus IV, it's probably not a bad idea to just double. If you think I'm going to give, I would give this one mil of detomidine, for instance. If you're going to go IM, give it two mils. It's a, just a general ballpark um, to start with. So things that you need to consider when you're coming up with your dose rate is the time needed to perform the rescue and then add time, add some buffering time because things never go according to plan or as quickly and smoothly as you would like. The stimulation that you're going to expect during the operation. So when we had those horses in the back of the boat, to me, the, the, there were two big stimulation. First, dragging that rescue boat or that glide onto the boat because the horses were just starting to become anesthetized. They weren't very deep because we weren't going to hang around and wait till their plane deepened, you know what I mean? I said, okay, well, it's been 10 minutes, I think we're pretty good now. We were going as fast as we could. And then the next major time was moving that glide off of the boat and onto the back of the trailer because again, there's noise, there's people talking, there's movement, there's skin you know, stimulation and whatnot. Um, those are the things you need to think of when you're, when you're deciding what you're going to um, treat them with or, or sedate them with or anesthetize them with. And then to a lesser extent, the status of the patient. Again, remember, adrenaline will override old, exhausted, dehydrated horses every day of the week. You can, if you give them too much sedation, you can give them reversals. Um, they're not commonly, either the alpha-2 reversals, which are the adapamazole, the cohimbine, and the telazoline, they're not commonly used. They're extremely expensive, and actually, they do risk um, some hypotension problems and even stopping their heart. I don't even know that we have any at our practice, so we, it's not very common. They are available. And then there is um, a nalo there's an opioid reversal, which is called naloxone. And again, extremely expensive. And the dose for horses probably cost prohibitive in most situations. When it comes to anesthetizing, um, I mean, that to me means the horse is immobilized. It is asleep. It is not going to respond. I could jump up and down and wave my arms and break open a plastic bag and, do you know what I mean, and, and poke it and whatnot, and it's not going to move. Um, they need to be sedated first, and you need to have at least five and maybe longer minutes after you sedate them before you can give them the drugs to immobilize them. 
Um, so you need to factor that into your time and you need to make sure the rescue team know that you're just not going to walk up, give them an injection and in a minute everything's good to go. The most common protocol we use is ketamine and Valium. Um, now, ketamine inadvertent, you guys probably are aware that ketamine has um, recreational drug activity use. Um, so inadvertent administration in humans um, will cause hallucinations and in high doses can cause respiratory compromise. And I put this in there, um, anyways, I don't know, inadvertent Valium administration in, in humans is probably just going to make everybody a little more relaxed, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> All right. Now, the hobble lift, if we're going to do, attempt something like this, the horse absolutely must be anesthetized. You need IV access, and that means an IV, an indwelling IV catheter, and preferably um, some extension of some sort in which you can inject, so you're not having to get right up at the neck and put yourself in a dangerous situation while gaining access to that catheter. You need a set of leg hobbles, and you should put um, a single leg hobble, if you can, on each individual leg. So if things all go to hell and the horse wakes up before you've got those leg hobbles off, you haven't hobbled their legs together. Um, you need to support their head and protect their eyes. And ideally, um, some sort of head protection gear would have been um, ideal, um, not only from all the brush and the bramble going up there, but from that rope just abrading the cornea. But on the hindsight, it's always 20-20, but this is what we could have done better. Um, this, this was Derek's um, rescue, not mine. Um, and you can see the head is actually attached to the... What are you laughing at? What did I do? <laughs> it was inadvertent. Anyways, you can see the head actually attached up to the winch um, so that head is just not flailing back and out of control. All right? um, in a situation like that, um, you, if you have the op opportunity and the drugs, something which I call triple drip, some other people may call GKX, is the way to go, and that is basically a, a infusion of drugs that will prolong your anesthetic time um, quite significantly and is, a, is quite safe to use. So for my, the, when I make up triple drip, I use um, one liter of 5% guafenicin, which is uh, muscle relaxant amongst other properties, one gram of ketamine, and 500 milligrams of xylazine. Ideally, you deliver it to your, so uh, you've sedated the animal, You've induced the animal with ketamine and Valium, and you've got it asleep. And then to lengthen your anesthetic time, especially in a horse like that, that you're not going to be able to go, hold the phone, guys. I just need to jump in there and give it a little bit of a top up, right? It'll buy you some extra time. Um, delivered to effect approximately three mils per kilogram an hour. One to two drops a second will do. Um, you need to have a secure IV catheter for many reasons. An extension set, which is just tubing that we fit to the catheter that is about yay long, and you can actually hook a number of them together, is an excellent way to go because then you've got some length, right? And you can just lightly secure that under a elastoplast. You can grab the end and give it a bit of a tug if you need some distance. Um, and then a pressure bag. You, you can get your IV, um, you can put your IV bag in there, which where your triple drip would be, and inflate the bag and keep it dripping in over time. And you could. Um, in that situation, you could have actually blown up the bag a little bit, kept it dripping to make sure it didn't black up blood, and actually elastoplasted that, that to the horse's neck as well and give it a little bit of triple drip as it actually went up, um, went up the side of the cliff. The other thing I would say um, about that is it's the easiest thing to do for a vet, but throw some super glue in the back of your car because super gluing those catheters in is the fastest and most effective way of getting initial, in, in a situation you might not have time to suture, be able to suture, want to stay down there long enough to suture, a little bit of triple um, or super glue will buy you a long way. All right, recovery. You want to recover them in a quiet, safe area, minimizing noise, um, covering their eye if possible, put a halter on the downside, put a, a pad the halter on the downside, that's just to protect the nerve on the side of the face, that's not critical, but if you've got a towel and you can stuff it between the halter and the side of the face, why not? And um, when you've got the horse lying down, positioning. So you're in a good, safe position there. You want to drag their bottom leg as far forward as you can, both front and hind. Now, this picture here is courtesy of one of my colleagues, um, Frank Conan, who's actually the current EVA president. This was one of the first horses that he gelded. And he said to me, he gelded it in the middle of the largest paddock he could find. And that was the only obstacle in the paddock. And where did the horse end up? He said he got up and he somersaults and he carried around and away he went and went. He said he was miles for this when he started. I'm sure that's an exaggeration, but that's where the horse ended up. So remember about your recoveries. No matter how well controlled you like to think they're going to be, they can go, they can get pretty excited 
um, exciting and pretty uncontrolled, make sure you are recovering the horse to the best of your ability in a safe spot, not by the side of the highway, not when there's an open gate, not when they can fall back in the ditch. It's very important to do what you can um, to move them somewhere because no matter how strong I think I am, right, and there's nothing you can do if they really are going to have a bad recovery to keep them in a confined spot or a safe position. As far as euthanasia, chemical or bullet, um, in this country and from my experience, um, chemical euthanasia has been the way I have euthanized horses, okay? So you do need secure IV access. It is a very large volume and it needs to be put on, in under a fairly short period of time to avoid um, excitement and uh, not a very nice euthanasia situation. Um, at least in New South Wales, and I'm not sure if it's all over the country, but um, the penobarbitone is dyed green, so we know, we know you know, there's no chance of inter or mixing it up with another drug. Um, as I said, fast injection is imperative to avoid excitement. Now, inadvertent human, and this is something that the, I think is important for the rescue teams to know because I think they're very fearful of pentobarbitone and they're very fearful because they can see this is a drug that's going to take this 500 kilogram horse and render it dead, okay? Um, inadvertent human um, administration causes some sedation and some headaches, and I can speak from that from personal experience. But actually, you, get, you need really large volumes for, um, required for coma or death, like enormously large volumes. So although you don't want to be really, you don't want to have any contact with this if you can, if there is, a, if there is an inadvertent mishap, it's not the end of the world. You're not going to drop dead after a meal, you know what I mean, in five steps. So, yes? Yep. I wouldn't probably wait for somebody to bring a firearm um, because I think if I've decided to euthanize a horse, I'd probably want to do that as quickly as possible. And I guess using a firearm in a confined space or whatever. And I'm not comfortable with a firearm. So probably that makes that reason the top of the list, okay? Um, yes, it'll make it slower, right? But the drug does go to the head pretty quickly. And it may take it longer for the horse to drop, but I'm not sure it's dramatically less humane. If, we, if I'm euthanizing a really sick colic with really bloody bad blood pressure, sorry, it can take longer than I like. Does that make sense? If I'm really worried about that, what I would do is probably anesthetize it with xylazine, ketamine. And, if I'm, and that's what I'll do if I'm euthanizing a horse and I have an owner present and I'm worried about the horse is really sick and I think this is going to be a bit slow or a bit awkward and it's going to be very con more confronting for the owner, I will anesthetize them first and then I'll use the overdose. So that's an uh, option. I don't think the horse is aware at that point. Does that make sense, what is happening? But uh, it's other people with different experiences and comfort with firearms probably have a completely different answer. Um, all right, as far as firearms go, um, I think all I'll say about this in the interest of time is if you're going to euthanize a horse with a firearm, you need to know your anatomy and you need to know your landmarks or it will be a complete epic disaster. What happens most of the time if people aim too low and they end up blowing a, a hole in the horse's sinus, which is actually quite large, and that is um, very unappealing, very upsetting for everybody and is not going to result in death. So somebody asked a question earlier, I think, about if you have a situation where, which is getting out of control, do you have, I think it was, the question was directed at Jim, do you, what do you do if you have got somebody who is absolutely um, a liability and putting lives in danger? This, at least in New South Wales, are the agency-specific powers at an animal rescue incident. And if you look down the list, I guess the take-home message is the RSPCA and the police, they have the powers to enter a property without permission, to remove people, whether they like it or not, to damage, you know, to take down a fence if they need to, to get access to somewhere else, um, to control and coordinate a, a scene, to restrain or remove aggressive people or animals or whatever. Um, the only thing the vets are allowed to do is have the power to euthanize, right? Which is okay. But if you, as a veterinarian and as a professional, as a profession, I tell people if you go to a scene and things, and you're thinking this is all bad and the owner's very aggressive and you're feeling uncomfortable, then you need to call, you need to, you should have had triple zero on the phone already, and you need to actually um, get either RSPCA or police on the scene and they will look after this for you. So I guess in summary, the veterinarian's role is crucial to facilitate me medical uh, stabilization and diagnosis. 
facilitate rescue using sedation, anesthesia, and recovery, and recommend euthanasia if that's what is indicated. However, we must do that within the incident control uh, command system, and we must remember that we have to put safety first, in particular safety of humans. The top three mistakes that veterinarians make is they try to take the role of the incident commander, maybe because we just like to be in charge, I don't know. We are, but we are used to being in charge, so we need to retrain ourselves as veterinarians. That's not appropriate in this situation. We assume we should participate in the operational part of the plan. That's what we're used to doing. We want to help. So we need to, as a profession, realize that that's, again, not appropriate. And then failure to treat hypothermia. Most horses you rescue will get up and go over and eat something and have a, a drink of water. But as a veterinarian, that is where your role is just beginning. That animal is going to need support, surveillance, and probably a lot of intervention if it's going to make it. Don't just go home when it gets out. So in summary, I guess combining the skills and the experience of rescue personnel with veterinarians can only result in safer and more positive outcomes. And we need to continue to work as a team. So I'll take any questions or comments.